Hello, I'm Professor Liu. Welcome to our live stream. I'm here today with art prof teaching artist Lauren Welch. And today we are talking about whether you should get an MFA in studio art. If you would like to grow as an artist and you can't afford an art class, we've got everything you need here at Art Prof, critiques and tutorials. Lauren and I both have our own personal experiences with an MFA. I got my MFA way long ago, like 18 oh, yeah. years ago, long ago. And Lauren, right now you're in the middle of doing your MFA at Hunter College. So that's well on its way. But how did you make the decision whether to go and get an MFA in studio art? Yeah, that was difficult because actually my default position was that I was always going to get an MFA. Again, for those of you that don't know, I come from a background that a family of artists, basically, and also a family of educators. These are like the two things. Uh, so my dad is an artist and he also got an MFA and then he also taught high school art and uh, college level art and workshops. And then my grandfather was an artist. I don't know if he got an MFA, but he also taught art. So this is a thing. And I got out of my undergrad and I was initially thinking, yes, I'm gonna go do this because I'm gonna go teach art like my father and grandfather, that's just what we do, I guess. But as I was going along and have more experiences in the art world and in the education world, my thoughts shifted a bit. And also it costs a lot of money or a lot of programs are very prohibitive. So I really had this crisis and I had to make sure I was in exactly the right place and time to be able to go and do my MFA. So I, I waited five years before going in. I graduated 2015, it's now 2020, yeah. And by the way, the images that we'll be showing all of you during this stream, this is Lauren's actual portfolio that she sent to apply for the MFA at several schools. I did the same thing. You guys will get to see my MFA portfolio in a little bit. Yeah, it's a complicated decision because there's so many factors that go into it. So if you guys don't know, an MFA stands for Masters of Fine Arts. And if you are a studio artist, it is your terminal degree. There's no degree beyond an MFA for you to do. And oftentimes it's confusing because people say, oh, well, why don't you get your PhD? I'm like, well, you do that if you're going for a degree in art history but in studio art, it's the MFA. So it's two years and then that's it, you're done. So just to clarify, Cerulean asks, what does the term studio art actually mean? Does it mean fine art? Mostly it does from the MFA programs that I've seen, although there are certainly programs in illustration and there are some in graphic design, but Lauren, would you say that most of them are in fine arts? I think so, actually, but that that's because that's my bias. That's where I've been looking. So those are the programs that I know. I was actually kind of surprised that an MFA existed for something that Jordan was doing with character design. I just didn't know. I guess that's more towards the illustration field side of things in my world. So those programs do exist as well. I just think there aren't as many of them. That's the difference is that the, the core bulk of MFA programs that are out there are mostly for fine art. All right, so we also have another question here from Cerulean. They're saying MFAs pay the students, don't they? So you make a little bit while earning your MFA. It really depends <laughs> on the program <laughs> because some programs We'll have, for example, a teaching assistant position where you make some amount of money for teaching an undergraduate class, but the structures for that are so all over the place. Like there's no format that all the schools follow. There are some schools, they don't even give you the opportunity <laughs> to teach. Like my school didn't do that. 
there's other schools where they will give you money for everything and you don't pay a dime. So it really, really depends, I suppose. Yeah. Um, I would just say more and more that this idea of paying someone in their MFA is becoming rarer and rarer. You, you have tuition. It's not the same as a PhD program. I, I can explain this because my sister is in a PhD program right now for neuroscience at MIT. So the difference is in an MFA program, you get charged tuition and, or, or maybe you get like a scholarship for that, but your teaching is a separate thing that offsets the costs of the tuition. Sometimes you can find a free program in there somewhere. I know Rutgers is free, for instance. In my particular case at Hunter, you can get studio or you can get a credit, a school credit for teaching classes, but you don't get paid, which is a weird thing. I don't think that's very common, but my school is also very inexpensive. My sister's program, she does not, in her PhD, they pay her a stipend to be there. She doesn't have to pay a tuition thing. They're just paying her straight up as if she's working there as well. And she's learning in addition to that. And that's common in the sciences, I would say. But in studio art, that usually is not the case. So I want to clarify a couple of things because I know that in art, sometimes the degrees are really confusing for people. Like a lot of people don't realize that if you want to teach K to 12, you don't need an MFA. You need to get certification to teach. But if you want to teach college, you need an MFA. So we have a question here from Michelle who's saying, why isn't a PhD common in art as in many fields. It's not that it's not common, it doesn't exist. There is no PhD to be a studio artist. The only PhD that's remotely art related that exists is the one in art history. Yeah. And art history is a totally different field. I mean, it's academic, it's a whole other universe. And so the studio art field, it's, it's very limited in terms of what is available for people to do. Yeah. This is one of the factors that I think people should consider if they're thinking about an MFA. Wasted Melon says, I was under the impression that the most popular MFA programs were expensive as hell. What do you think, Lauren? Yep, you're right. That impression is correct. I think that within that, so if you're thinking about the art schools that come to mind right off top of your head, there's Yale, there's RISD, there's UCLA, there's BARD, there's a few others in there, Pratt's and things like that. All the- Columbia. Columbia, Columbia is the biggest one. Oh my God. <laughs> Columbia is the biggest offender of this. So your MFA program is two years long and the price range for a year, uh, a, or yeah, a year of tuition is between 50,000 or 45,000 and 75,000 a year at these schools. That's pretty intense. And there are a few schools in there that are great schools, like mine, Hunter. I, I go here, guys, I am, I am biased. I'm not trying to sell the school, I just go there. But I particularly chose this school because it's very inexpensive. Once I'm in state, I'll be paying about 6,000-ish, 7,000-ish, 6,000-ish a year, something like that. It's really not that much. So, and UConn is another great example of a school that has an art program that's really good, but it's very inexpensive to go there. Rutgers, amazing program, top program, it's free. They give a scholarship that's full for anyone that goes there. Cooper Union also has this for their undergrad. I don't know about their MFA program. So this is one of the reasons why you really should think about the financial investment that will go into an MFA and whether you're at a point in your life where that makes sense. Because for some people, 70000 a year is prohibitive and would be an absolute hardship. And you have to ask yourself, are you going to get enough out of that experience 
for that to really be worth it? Or are you willing to do the research and apply a million times until you find a school program where you don't have to pay that kind of money? And it's a real problem for a lot of students who want to get the MFA. What are the differences, Clara, between an MFA versus an, is it an atelier? Atelier? I think so. <laughs> Something like that. <laughs> I mean, the main difference is that the MFA, you get an actual degree, which then qualifies you to do a number of things. Primarily, when you get the MFA, you are then qualified to teach at the college level. That's why I went. I mean, I certainly was happy to have more studio time and develop myself artistically. But for me, that was the reason I wanted to go. And I knew I had to go because there was no way around it. I couldn't just hope they hired me. You have to have an MFA. So that's the main difference. If you go to an atelier, you don't get a degree. So if you go to an atelier, you get the studio experience and you get the time learning all that skills, but you don't end up with a degree. Well, the other thing I would say too about ateliers is that they're pretty small. I don't tend to see ateliers that are like big universities or anything like that. And they do tend to be very skill-based as opposed to more MFA programs, which I think tend to be more about engaging critically with your work. Can, can you briefly explain what an atelier is because that's actually a word that I didn't encounter until after I did my BFA. Well, like I said, with the MFA programs, there's many different formats for ateliers. But in my view, from what I have seen, and you guys can totally correct me if I'm wrong, it's like a little art school. It's like a group of people and you work intensively together. I don't know if they specifically have classes, but it's very focused. And I have a friend who has taught many workshops at ateliers across the world, all over the US. And from what she tells me, people there are really intense and really, really focused and tend to be more on the academic traditional side of skills compared to the MFA programs, which I think tend to be more about the contemporary art scene. In a nutshell, like I said, that is a total generalization. I am not totally correct in all that. I think that was a great explanation. Thank you for that. Amanda Moore is getting right into the meat of it here. What kind of questions should undergrads ask themselves if they're interested in an MFA, I'm assuming here? Well, I think the first question is, what are your goals? What are you trying to do? Do you want to be an exhibiting New York City gallery artist? Or do you just want to sell your work? Because those are two totally different lifestyles, okay? Or do you want to be a tenured professor at a university? Or do you just want to develop artistically? That's so important because honestly, if you just want to work on your studio practice, there are much cheaper ways <laughs> to do it. So Lauren, why would you pick the MFA over say doing an artist residency, which is where you go away for two months and get to work on your stuff? I highly recommend artist residencies to people who are out of undergrad that are considering maybe doing an MFA program in the future because you are generally going to meet the same types of people in a residency that you would in an MFA program and you have those kinds of conversations and you have that really intense studio time. So a residency, I've done a few, I've gone to Vermont Studio Center, I've been to Arts Lars and Numbers, which is in New York, Vermont, Vermont Studio Center is in Vermont, and then elsewhere studios in Colorado. All those were very different experiences, but what tied them all together is I took a month, they were month-long residencies each, and I took that month out of my life and I was strictly working on art, art in the studio, speaking with other artists, doing everything with other artists in a way that, reminded me very much of my school years, except on a more mature, living, the real life kind of basis. Yeah, and so a residency for some people, it makes much more sense. And it's also sometimes a nice little trial run because yeah. an MFA is two years. And if you do a residency for a month and you discover, oh, this is not for me, maybe that's a good way to figure that out. 
We have a question from MJ. Would you say that where your degree MFA is from would impact any potential college professor jobs at certain schools? What do you think, Lauren? Yes, yes, it does. It really does. I So, okay, there are several ways of thinking about this. You can think about this by the prestige of the school, which is problematic because I think many different schools, many levels of schools can give equivalent qualities of education. So there's another way of thinking about this as well, and that is geographically. If there's a particular area that you want to be or teach in, it is wise to do your MFA in that same location because then you can get more ingrained in that particular art scene. For the the pedigree fancy school stuff, basically all the schools across the US compete to have people teaching in their program that come from these specific schools because it looks really good. So that can be a way to have a broader, uh, broader appeal, I guess. But I think either way is really valid. I mean, I'm sorry to say this, you guys, but at the big major programs, art schools across the nation, you have to go to Columbia or Yale for them to be interested in you. And I saw it time and time again. I was passed over for full-time college teaching positions by people who went to Yale who were half my age. And I'm sure that had something to do with it because I did not go to a big name school. I went to the New York Academy of Art which does not have the reputation that Columbia and Yale have, and I definitely paid for it in the end. That said though, Yale and Columbia are really hard to get into, and at a certain point you have to say, is this really worth waiting for? Do I apply for 10 years until I get into Yale? And is Yale even a good fit for you? It's really, really tricky because yeah. I don't think I should be telling people, oh, go to the school, because if you don't, you won't get hired. I mean, that's such a shallow reason to pick a program. But the reality is they do care if you went to Yale or Columbia. That's really what matters. Yeah. Michelle A is saying, if the classes are online only because of COVID, BFA or MFA, are they worth the money? I'm struggling with this right now. Well, Lauren, you're in the middle of it right now. So how is it for you? That is a great question. And I think whatever answer that you choose is valid because there are a lot of different situations and it's really hard for everyone right now. I stayed within my program. I did not take a semester off or anything because our studios are open with COVID restrictions and safety precautions, of course, but they also made it so that we could take reduced credits or take more art history credits. I think it really depends on what type of degree and what type of credits you are getting in a semester, what you wanna get. So the studio ones are really hard. I think you really need to, I mean, we do, we critique artwork all the time on Art Prof digitally, and that works really well for us. Most classes are really struggling in the studio element right now, trying to critique artwork that you can't see in person and trying to make connections with people that you're not getting to hang out with in person. With the art history courses, it's different. You're really, it's really all about this discussion over texts that you're reading. And there are lots of slideshows anyways and stuff when you're taking art histories at school. So those really work quite well for Zoom, I feel like, or this digital education. And also the price of your school, I think is important. Again, in my situation, it makes sense. I'm not, I've got skin in the game, but it's not so, so bad. I'm not, if, if I was paying $50,000 a year, I would definitely take a semester off or a year off. So you're really, you, you should, if you're looking into programs, you should ask the school this semester, next semester, okay, what are you doing to protect students? What is your studio policy like right now? What, how many, or how many credits can I take in a semester? And are there scholarships right now or support systems right now? These, I do want to say, actually, there is one good thing to the to this Zoom world of, of education. And that is 
all MFA programs are really about bringing in famous artists and visiting lecturers. And with the digital platforms, we can now bring in people from all over the world. And that's been an excellent opportunity. That's been so nice to have that. So that is one plus side to having this digital education paying for that. I mean, Michelle, I would just say that it's a really personal decision. It fluctuates, even two students at the same school are having completely different financial situations and their family situation, their home life. I mean, I just think you guys should do what you think is healthiest for you. Yeah. Financially, mental health, physical health, that is more important than anything else. So I would look at those things and then go from there because it's very, very tricky to make that decision. AJ is saying, which MFAs would you suggest for interdisciplinary work? I enjoy working in photography, watercolors, drawing, and writing, and I want to combine them all. All right, so thoughts about majors, Lauren, because in an MFA program, you do apply as a painting major. That is not the same as a BFA program where you just apply to get in. Yeah. Yeah, and that is a huge thing. MFA programs are really looking for a person that fits within their making culture. So this is this is photography, watercolors, drawing, writing, all these things actually do fit in what I would call the traditional painting root of our art. I think most of the MFA students that I'm with right now who are primarily painters are also doing all of these things. So when you get in, just because you are within this one major doesn't mean that you can't do all those things. They don't focus on you like that. You are told to do to go into all of the things, to try everything new possible because these are your special two years. That being said, there are programs that are more interdisciplinary than others. I think Bard has a really great program like that. Tyler does as well. Tyler in uh, Philadelphia. Uh, I think Cranbrook also has a fairly good interdisciplinary program. Um, I'm just listing names here. Sorry, guys. Maybe we'll put these in the Discord later as far as schools go. What about you, Clara? Do you know any programs like that? It really depends. I mean, it, it's so hard to give advice on this topic because the range of MFA programs that are out there, it's so broad. Because the school I went to, people who were painting majors painted. People who were drawing majors drew. Now there's other schools where the joke is that nobody in painting paints. And so it really depends on what you see. I mean, what I would say, if you guys are researching schools, look at the student work that's coming out of the program. So you say, okay, these people are painting majors. What type of work are they making? So then you can see, oh, this is a program that calls it painting major, but really it's a free for all. OK, or you can look at another program and say, oh, the painting people are painting. So it, a lot of this, I think, more so than a BFA, you need to do major research. Yeah. To figure out the structure. Who's the faculty? What type of work is being made there? Because if you guys go by that school website, they're all fabulous, right? Yeah. It is, <laughs> I it took me I applied to school MFA programs three times, three years in a row. And each time was a little bit different with the choosing of schools. So it's definitely a long-term process, I'm going to say. There are people that do it straight out of their BFA and just get into a school and go. But I would say that that's not usually the norm, really. There's a lot of thought and the labor that goes into it. And um, I just wanted to show this comment here. Um, Ibekwe, I hope I pronounced your name right, I'm sorry if I didn't, says, can someone who majors in art history as an undergraduate do an MFA in studio practice painting and then go back to art history for PhD? Is that a pathway that you've seen, Clara? Well, the whole qualification to be accepted into an MFA program, you just need an undergrad degree. It doesn't matter if you were an English major or a philosophy major or a studio art major, it's totally fine. And I had a professor at RISD who did his undergrad at Stanford and then did his MFA at Yale 
And that's fine. You meet a lot of people who are like that. So a BFA from an art school is by no means a necessary degree to have to be able to be eligible to apply for an MFA. Now, let's say you start with art history in undergrad and then do MFA in studio and then go back to the art history for PhD. I mean, first of all, you got to have a lot of money to do that because that's a lot of school. And also you're talking about two very different fields. I mean, I know a lot of people think, oh, well, it's studio art and art history. They're definitely related, but you could be on another planet <laughs> in terms of art history. And the example I would give is that I taught at a liberal arts college that had a studio art and art history department. So there were art historians, there were studio people. Honestly, they could have been in Pakistan. I mean, we rarely interacted at all. And so you have to ask yourself, like, do you really want to be split like that? I, I would find that very hard to manage. That's, what do you think, Lauren? That's so weird that you say that because I don't have that impression at all. I see a lot of or an increasing amount of this sliding between the two fields. It might just be my program. I'm in, so I'm in the MFA program, but I am interested in curatorial studies, which is this kind of intermediary or intermediate program between art history and the MFA program. MA, art history program is an MA, a master's in the arts. And anyways, as an MFA, we have to take a few numbers of art history courses and the art history people have to take a few MFA courses. There's this weird in-between section. So we actually talk with each other a fair bit. We are related. And just in the field, the larger field, I have seen several people do the MFA in painting or studio art and then do their PhD in art history. One of my friends, actually my boss from the Sharon Arts, she was doing, she did that, that trajectory. And I think that there is an increasing amount of writing that is done by artists and art history kind of work that was traditionally this separate field is now being melded into this practice of also making. But uh, that could also be an age gap too that we have here. Like maybe the practice is changing. I think it is because where I came from, the art historians who were in that department, they were like 70, okay? They're not like the new generation of art historians and they had a very traditional, this is how the field is run type of approach to things. And I think you're in such a different place, number one, because your program is set up that way, but also you're doing this, what, 20 years, like past when I was doing yeah. it. So yeah. yeah, it is important to think about those generational differences because the fields are different depending on who you speak to. We have some questions about residencies. So Cerulean is saying, were the residencies expensive? And also Orange Cat is saying, do residencies pay? It's a similar thing. There are so many <laughs> different residencies. Like there's some where you're basically paying for the whole thing. Like, I'm not kidding. You have to read the fine print because a lot of them don't give you very much. And then there's other ones, like the most prestigious one is probably the Rome Prize, which is basically where you're like paid to make your work in Rome. They give you a studio. It's like the sweetest deal ever. And then there's everything in between. So yeah. Lauren, what was your experience like in terms of the cost? Residencies are super interesting. In some ways, I find them more broad than MFA programs, which I think is actually really great. And they're not as stratified by price and prestige. So and what I mean by that is that there are lots of very fancy programs that are free or will pay. I used to live in the area where McDowell, McDowell Colony, did that's a residency a very famous residency and if you get in that is free you're just there vermont studio center charges a fair amount of money like several thousand dollars but also they put out a lot of scholarships so i got to go to that for free 
which was really nice. Always apply to the scholarships, always apply to the financial aid. It is, you don't lose anything by doing that. Then there are these smaller residencies. Some will ask you to pay like $400. It's basically like cheap rent for room, like food, board, studio, all that. Been to some of those. And then others have a fund that they pay you out of. They want you to come there. I think there were some residencies in Nebraska that were like this. And internationally, there are residencies like that. There's some residencies in Japan that I've seen that will pay you to be there, which I think is amazing. What you need to do again is a ton of research on this and see what kind of program is going to fit you best. Because a lot of these ask you in return to do a certain amount of work have a presentation, work in the community, maybe teach a class. It's really varied. So we have a question from W315. They're saying, outside of an MFA, are there other settings where I can develop my critical thinking? Well, Art Prof is one place. In our Discord, we have all this stuff going on pretty much every night. Residencies, as we said, that's another option. But I also think some people, you might think about being part of an artist co-op like, for example, I have a bunch of friends who are in the Boston Sculptors Gallery, which is an artist co-op. I was in Boston Printmakers for a little while. So there are definitely options out there. But I think that the real difference is the degree and probably all the people that they put through the MFA programs in terms of the visiting lecturers. I mean, when I was at New York Academy of Art, they brought in really big name people and you got to see so many lectures. I mean, there's no chance you'd be able to go to that many lectures of that many critics and artists in such a concentrated amount of time. I mean, wouldn't you say, Lauren, that's a major feature of the MFA program? It is, but I do want to say Vermont Studio Center is set up like that where they bring in lectures. I think you can go to four or five within the one month that you're there. And th that's different disciplines. There were two painters that came and then there were some writers that came and some sculptors and stuff like that. So these things do exist, but it's in this tiny amount. You can only be there for one month. And that's where I found out, I was like, okay, this is really the time to go to MFA because an MFA is just like this. It's set up very similarly. So I just need to bite the bullet and actually go. Uh, there, oh, you got a question here. That's good. Okay. All right. So we have some questions about some of my pieces oh, no. that I was showing you guys earlier. Let me just go back to some of the images that people are talking about. So Cerulean is asking, what do the extra limbs mean? And by the way, if you didn't hear this, the images you're seeing in this stream are the portfolios that Lauren and I use to apply to our MFA program. So this is old stuff. This is These painting I did. 20 years ago. I mean, it's like, oh God, I can't believe I ever made this stuff. I'll tell you guys, I will admit it. I was such a hot mess when I applied to graduate school. And I was telling Lauren earlier that my whole approach and, and look at my MFA program is, oh God, <laughs> like I just want to die when I think about the whole thing because it was a mess. Like I basically thought I was going to do better and I didn't, I only got into one school and it was my quote, safety school. And I felt very trapped that I had to go that year. Really, there was no reason. Like I should have done what you did, Lauren, which was take my time to get into a program that I really was happy with. I didn't do that because I thought I should have gone. <laughs> so oh, I don't know, the whole sure. thing is just a really crummy experience from my point of view. So I don't know. Oh. Anyway. There was not a lot of meaning behind the extra limbs. I don't know what I was doing at this time in my life, you guys. I just liked making things that were strange and bizarre. And I really think about myself as a late bloomer because I was not really engaging critically. I was not thinking about what is the context of the work. And so I look at this stuff and I'm just like, oh my God, Clara, you are so behind. Like I just, no. this, this was not a good period no. in my life. That's all I'm saying. <laughs> the, all the limbs show are a physical representation of how fraught you were on the inside, splitting yourself into different pieces, trying to figure out who you should be in your art life. 
That's what it was. That's what I meant to say. That's what you wrote <laughs> in your artist statement to schools. Yeah, that's exactly what I said. Exactly. So we have a question from Scott. Would an MFA sometimes help industry hiring prospects? I feel a bit out of the loop as an illustrator, but I wonder if it's even worth the MFA money. Lauren, what do you think? Oh, that's so hard. It hurts me to say this, but if you are thinking that you're going to go to an MFA because you're going to earn more money, I think that's probably a false assumption. It's not or, true. Yeah, because so right now the field of MFAs is very, there are a lot of MFAs right now and MFA graduates. So there's a ton of people that have this degree, but only a few jobs and only uh, a few places or comparatively few places that are accepting things of this degree. So the pay is generally fairly low. Uh, it's very competitive to get into things and it's extremely hard to work your way to the top because there are so many people. So, and there just aren't a lot of safety or accountability things for these hiring processes for these jobs. And this is both in the teaching field. We did a whole stream on adjuncting, which is a thing that a lot of schools practice in. And curatorial, curatorially as well, it's also really rigorous, hard work for fairly low pay compared to other jobs. You really have to make your own, you know, job afterwards. I just want to clarify though, Scott, if you want to be an illustrator or a sequential artist, the MFA does not matter. The MFA really makes a difference if you want to teach college or if you want to connect to the New York City art world and make those professional connections. For illustration, they could care less if you have an MFA. In fact, I would say it, it almost, it pretty much does not matter at all. In those fields, in illustration and sequential art, nobody will care if you have an MFA or not. So you're fine. You don't have to worry about it at all, Scott. Kate is asking, what are the career paths for MFAs? Lauren, you wanna take that? The, so the MFA thing, the reason to get the degree is if you want to stay within academia. I feel like, and by academia, I'm using a fairly broad approach here because I'm also including the gallery scene, which even though it's commercial, it professes to be within academia. You have all the critics that go there and do the writing of all the, the artwork that's coming from the schools. So if you want to be a part of this, this group of intellectuals, that that is where you go. So I, that being said, the three main jobs that I can think of getting an MFA, a fine art MFA would be you want to teach, you want to curate, or you want to write about artwork in a, and then the fourth one is if you want to show in galleries, but I don't really know that's considered a job because that's really like, how do I explain it? That's such a shot in the dark, even more so than these teaching kinds of things. This sounds so depressing. You have to have a lot of things aligned. Basically, you're there to show your artwork to tons of galleries, curators, all this stuff. And then they have to kind of make a decision amongst themselves if you're going to get some traction in the art world. And then they can drop you at any time. I guess that sounds very similar to teaching. I don't know. What are your thoughts on this, Clara? Well, I want to be clear about writing about art and a curatorial path because they're, they're different versions of being a curator. Like I know some people are freelance curators. So they just yep. come in and they do one show and that's it, okay? But you could also be like a full-time curator. Like you're the curator of European paintings at the Met in which case you must have a PhD. Like if you're a freelance curator, it's probably way looser and people maybe don't care as much, but you will not be looked at if you don't have a PhD and all the correct credentials to be a full-time museum curator. Now a museum curator is not the same thing as being a curator at a contemporary art center. So what I'm trying to say is that being a freelance curator, that that's not really a viable path if you want that to be your whole career because it, it's like showing in galleries. You don't always know that there's going to be a job for you. Same thing with writing 
for art. I mean, you people don't really hire like full-time writers unless you're like a staff writer at Art News, in which case you probably had to go to journalism school. <laughs> so well, it's so complicated, all these different things. There's a lot of versions of them. Yeah, I, I do want to say that this generation, I think, more has that interdisciplinary approach where you can do, say, an MFA or an MA and then get into that art writing stuff. It doesn't take a journalism degree specifically to do that thing. But I guess what I'm trying to say, though, Lauren, is that being a freelance writer and being a staff writer those are two very different lifestyles. Sure. And I would say most people, when they get out of their MFA, they're not going to eat on freelance writing. That's yeah, yeah, not that's, something that's, people do right off the bat. That's so true. We have a question from Kate. Do you have any information about dual degree MA, MFA museum studies? Been looking for these programs. I see they are on the rise. Lauren, you probably know more about this than I do because I'm not paying attention to a lot of the new programs. I, I don't know a ton about this, unfortunately. I feel like I should, but the reason why I chose my school, Hunter, was because they had that that program in between the two. They had this curatorial certificate program, which I, I don't know if I can say it's the equivalent to museum studies, but it is that thing where you do the MA courses and you do the MFA courses with the objective of... in interning or working at a gallery, having them steward you and then kind of not gallery museum and then transitioning into museum world doing these things. So that is a program that exists. Benjamin is saying, does the same apply to the field of animation? Does it only make sense again an MFA in animation? The person wants to become a professor or to make connections to get a job at an animation studio. Yep, the same thing. In yep. animation, nobody cares. If you have an MFA, unless you want to be an animation professor in academia, okay? This is where it's so confusing. Like people just think, oh, MFA, terminal degree, that's going to definitely help me. No, there, there are certain places where people don't care about the, that type of thing. The crazy thing about the MFA programs is that you don't even you're not even required to take pedagogy classes or teaching classes to teach. Like this is a degree assumably for teaching, but you're not really learning how to teach, which is really crazy to me. But it does, again, depend on program because yeah. RISD does have a collegiate teaching program. I know the people that run it. And so they have something, but not every school does. It really, really depends. Jacqueline is asking, are MFA programs welcoming? Or is a constant state of feeling intimidated? I'm an anxious human. Lauren, what's your experience been like? That also depends on the program. Yeah. There are programs that are out there that have a reputation of being very cutthroat. That I think RISD used to have this. I don't know if it's as much now or if it's the same. You could probably speak more to that, Clara. But I think Yale is the, the big one where they have things called pit crits which I have heard like horror stories out of. I don't think that they're actually as scary as they're made up to be, but that there is a culture of that. But there are also schools that are extremely very open and very nice. And I, I really just feel like an advertisement for Hunter right now. I'm so sorry. <laughs> but that it's is- good. It means you're where you should be. Yes, I, I have a very good fit for a school. I love my school. Hunter, the reason why I chose it is because it felt very down to earth. It's a public school and everybody has like a real life job in addition to making artwork. The program's three years long. So you are living your real life. So everybody is very aware of what it's like to be a working and poor human while taking classes. And we're all in solidarity together most of the time on that. It really depends on the program because I had a different experience. I mean, I was unhappy to begin with. So I would say that probably a lot of it was coming from myself, but my program, not that friendly. I mean, people weren't horrible. They weren't like out to kill each other or anything like that. But I did feel that people were very like, career driven and that they were talking about that all the time and this gallery and that curator and I just was like 
I just want to make work. Okay. Like, I mean, maybe that was my problem. Maybe I should have been more career oriented and less thinking about the development of artistic practice. Maybe that was my problem in myself. But I think that's why you really got to vet your program and see if it's actually a good fit for you. I think this is a great question here that brings up the one thing that I do want to talk about. AJ asks, if there are so many MFAs and very little jobs available to them, what would count as a good reason to study for an MFA besides becoming a better artist? This is the one good thing that makes MFAs worth it is if you are in a place in your life where you are stuck or you don't know where to go to from here. It, maybe it's location-wise, maybe it's in your art practice, maybe it's in your job world experience. You need to basically reset. That is a great reason to get an MFA. So I'm going to say, in my experience, I lived in New Hampshire for a very long time. I lived with my parents after getting out of school because I was paying off debt. And I had my job, but that was my network, really. I had friends down in New York, but it was too expensive for me to live there right off the bat. So applying to an MFA in New York City was a great way to give myself a structure and a reason and a pathway forward to make a life for myself on my own as an artist, as an adult, in a place where I had a starting network but didn't have the full thing yet so it ends up being a good decision for me because it's helping me firm up actually firm up the structure in all these other ways that will help my job life my personal life my artistic life in the long run the structure of an MFA program is not to be taken for granted because I know from myself and I'm sure for you Lauren the second you get in and then decide to enroll, your mind changes. You go, I am going to an MFA program. And all of a sudden, no matter what happens after, you have to step up because it feels more professional. You have all these critics and all these professional connections. You're surrounded by other people and you're there the whole time. And there's no other situation like that on the planet. I mean, outside of school, you have to have a job and you're not having such easy access to so many people. Because for me, a big part of it is, oh my God, you meet a lot of people who are pretty hot stuff in the industry if you go to a good prestigious MFA program and you can't get that anywhere else. So we're talking about all the reasons to not get an MFA because for some people it is way too expensive for the mm -hmm. amount, whatever that they get out of it. That's not to say you don't get anything. It's just that when it's $70,000 a year, you want to really make sure that it's actually something you really want to do. Yeah. Liz J saying, do MFA programs care of the undergraduate major? I didn't major in art in college, but I'm really interested in applying to Hunter. Well, Lauren, why don't you ask? Since they're, why don't you answer? Because they're asking about Hunter. They, they don't care. As long as you have compelling artwork and a compelling statement, actually sometimes having an undergraduate degree that's in something different is really interesting because they're constantly getting art school people coming in being like, hey, I want to get an MFA now because I already do art. So you can make a case for it. Don't let it get you down. And Liz J saying, are there any pre-MFA programs that helps to prepare people for an MFA application, such as a portfolio? So Liz, one thing you might consider doing is something called a post-bac program. And there are not a huge amount of them around. But when I taught at School of the Museum of Fine Arts in Boston, I did advise post-bac students Postback is usually a one-year program, and usually the people I see doing postbacks are people that did a liberal arts undergrad degree, and maybe they just didn't have the time to make the studio work, to make the portfolio, and so a lot of people do that. But that said, you can totally go to art school and do a postback program. I mean, that's totally up to you, but for a lot of people, that's a very good option because Sometimes you just don't really know until you actually make somewhat of a commitment. Oh, uh, sorry. Well, can we answer this one too? Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, can you do an MFA part-time over a longer period? This is a weird question. In my experience, I want to ask Clara your opinion on this too. In my experience, 
it seems like it's a more intensive type thing where you're going full time. However, saying that at, at my school, it is set up where you're doing it over three years. So it's more of a part time thing. You're taking less credits because they assume that you are working while you are making artwork. And there are also programs that are called low res programs, low residency programs, where you are working your regular life, your job, and you're making art for most of the year, taking an occasional like online course or mentorship with a professor. And then you have a super intensive time during the summer or during the winter where your whole student cohort is meeting up and having lectures, classes, critiques, all that stuff. What I mean, I have worked in low residency MFA programs. Like I had the student a couple of years ago, I was supervising them. And so I was their mentor for their low residency MFA program. And so that's probably the program you would want to go into if you don't want to be like a full out MFA student, because Lauren's right. A lot of the people who were in the low residency programs did have jobs they were doing at the same time. I don't know how long it takes but there are some low residency programs where it's like you don't even have to be on campus until like the third month of the semester. And so they're very different. Again, do your research, though, because I don't know in academia how much clout the low residency programs have. So if you want to teach in academia, it may not be the best choice, but I could be wrong. I mean, the, the thing you guys are probably noticing here is that the fields and the programs have changed so much. I mean, the numbers of people applying to MFA now, huge. They were not like this 30 years ago. It was starting to get bad when I was applying. I think it's even worse now for people trying to get in. And so that's what's hard is that a lot of the information about MFA programs, it's just not very up to date. <laughs> so that's why Lauren and I are actually a good pair because I'm the old fart telling you the stories of the 2000s and Lauren's telling you guys exactly what it's like right now, which I think super useful. Art Prof has a podcast, which is available on Spotify, also on iTunes. We would love it if you guys would leave us a rating and a review. Please join us on Discord. Lauren and I will be over there in the post live streams channel in a couple minutes. The invite link is in the video description below. Please subscribe to our YouTube channel and join the Art Prof family. And thank you so much to our top Patreon supporters who make everything possible here at Art Prof. Thank you to everybody for all your questions. I know a lot of this stuff with the degrees is so confusing, hard to get reliable information. So thank you everybody for enriching the conversation in that way. Everybody, thanks.